Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be here. I'm proud to be a member of this organization. Uh, right now, I even look forward to the next meeting, wherever that will be. I don't care which city I've been asked if I have a preference. No, I do not. Uh, I've heard some outstanding uh, lectures uh, yesterday and last night and this morning as well. And, uh, but nobody has mentioned uh, something that comes to mind to me yet, and that is uh, the gentleman from Hannibal, Missouri, Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain. He's famous for saying, everybody's always talking about the weather, but nobody does anything about the weather. <laughs> so, Mr. Mark Twain, uh, may I introduce you to Al Gore. <laughs> and... Um, after listening to these various uh, erudite uh, lectures, I would like to make a pronouncement of my own, um, and that is this. CO2, CO2 is to global warming, global warming, as the stork theory is to birthing babies. <laughs> now my theme today will be aviation, and it's uh, related perhaps to preparedness, and that's the word that's in our, the name of our organization. We've been preeminent in aviation. I don't know if that will remain the case, just as I don't know if uh, it will remain the case that America will be and continue to be the greatest nation on earth. We hope so. As President Reagan noted, it, we can lose it all in one generation. And uh, the beginning of losing it would be a poor educational system. And we certainly have that now. We talk about uh, doing this, the bigger push in the Congress right now is the a new health care system, if there is to be one. And uh, I've been told that if, we, if it does succeed, as the administration hopes, you'll need a whole lot more medical doctors. Where do they come from suddenly? I don't know the answer to that. So let me get back to uh, my theme today, which is aviation. And uh, if we have time, I would talk about a few other little things. And one of them would be Bob Hope. He's from Burbank, was. I'm from down there in Burbank. Lockheed was there for decades. They've since merged with Martin Corp. And the name of the company now is Lockheed Martin. Corporation, and they moved the headquarters to Bethesda, Maryland. Why did they do that? Because it's closer to the font of money known as the Pentagon. And they're still the largest defense contractor. And another one would be a little over a month ago, I was in Toulouse, France, with the experimental test pilots of Europe. And we had never been down there before. Each uh, year, they meet in a different host country. And then when it was in France heretofore, we would always be in Paris. But this time they thought it'd be a good idea to go down there near the Pyrenees Mountains. And that's where Airbus is located, where they built the Concorde, the supersonic Mach 2 aluminum Concorde. And that's where they're building that big new A380 right now that carries 800 people, depending on the uh, customer. Uh, Singapore Air was the first one to get one and they downsized it to a little below 600 people. We can talk about that um, in my visit there. And the time, the man I spent the most time with was in Toulouse, the uh, primary supersonic test pilot for the Russians. And he, uh, I'd met him in Rome. He came up to me and said, I've heard of you. I've heard of the SO-71. I want to meet you. And he spoke in poor English. And that was seven, six or seven years ago. And this time his English is better, and he's about, um, I think he's, he was, um, in July, he was 87 years old. And that would be of interest if we have time to talk about that. I'm here primarily to, however, my primary uh, purpose is to tell you about the Leonardo da Vinci of aviation design. That would be Clarence L. Johnson, nicknamed Kelly Johnson. He got that nickname at about age 12 when he got into a fight with another boy and um, I think he broke his leg or something like that. Uh, uh, he's told me about it, but I don't remember the details. But he wanted everyone to call him Kelly, which everyone did except his secretary who says, I don't feel calling, comfortable calling you Kelly and I prefer to call you Mr. Johnson. So 
Verna Palm was his secretary, and she was the only one that did it that way. And so I brought um, some a PowerPoint, which uh, Jeremy will operate here in a minute. That's a head-on view of the SR-71 there, and this is Kelly down here in the lower right with a uh, U-2 at the top and an SR-71 at the bottom. And he, uh, as much as anybody, along with Edward Teller, in my opinion, uh, helped uh, win the so-called Cold War with Russia. So I'll start now chronologically talking about uh, Clarence L. Kelly Johnson. He was born of Swedish parents in upstate Michigan, Ish Peming, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And he was from a very, very poor family. He's a pure-blooded Swede, by the way. And I made a talk in Sweden several years ago. And they asked me, where were his parents from in Sweden? And I said, we never talked about that. And had we done so, I wouldn't have known what he was talking about because the only place I knew anything about was uh, Stockholm. And so uh, he uh, went to, wound up going to Flint, Michigan, to... Um, the school there, and then from there he went to University of Michigan, and he worked his way through school, and he told, when he told me that, I said, how did you do that, the classical way, waiting on tables? And he said, well, a little of that, but primarily tutoring the dullards. That gives you an insight into his persona right there, because he was always a top-notch uh, scholar, and, um, and it has a lot to do with his persona, which I'll tell you more about later on. And he got, what he meant by that was he got a job working for the wind tunnel professor. And America had very few wind tunnels back in those days. They had the Guggenheim in Caltech, which after he got out to Lockheed, uh, he utilized. So um, he would grade the papers of the other students, etc. So when he got to Lockheed, which was already a world famous name, courtesy of... Um, a lot, back when they had single-engine airplanes and they were wood and fabric, and Wally Post held the world, around the world record seven days, I was in a Lockheed airplane. And so uh, the Depression came on, and Lockheed went broke. And um, a par partnership bought him out of bank bankruptcy. It was headed by Bob Gross of Philadelphia and his brother, Cortland Gross, and a couple of partners. And it went for $40,000, like he did. And the judge in 1932 bangs his gavel and looks down and says to Bob Gross, young man, I sure hope you know what you're doing. And because uh, $40,000 was a lot of money during the Depression. And so uh, his philosophy of buying it at that time was to go to a twin-engine airplane and so that will be the first slide that we talk about here. If you would give me the, that's the SR-71. And that's the one that uh, still is the world's fastest airplane ever created. And I'll tell you more about that later, but I want to do this chronologically. And so that we can, there, this is the one. Now, this came straight out of the uh, wind tunnel at Michigan. And you note it has a tail wheel and it has two engines, and it has two little tails, uh, vertical tails, right behind each engine. And so that airplane got designed. Kelly Johnson came out to Burbank in 1932 and wanted to get a job as, after he had graduated from University of Michigan. And they said, well, we don't have enough business to give you a job, so why don't you go back to Michigan and get a master's, and also uh, here's a model, and... Um, check it out and come back next summer and see what, uh, maybe we can hire you then, and then you can tell us what you think of this model. And luckily for Kelly, the man that designed it was Hall Hibbard, and he was a very gracious fellow from Glendale, right next door to Burbank. I knew Mr. Hibbard myself. And, um, and so uh, Kelly took it back there, and then when he came out the next summer, he said he was in a dilemma because he had found out their model was no damned good. And uh, he wanted to tell them the truth, but he thought in that event they'd think, what does he know about it? How, we won't hire him. So luckily, uh, Hall Hibbard was the type of man that he could tell the truth to and still get hired. So that's what happened. And um, later on, I remember uh, Kelly was always so busy, we didn't have time to talk about uh, just historical matters much, but 
I said to him, did Hall Hibbard design that Lockheed Electra? Lockheed named all of the airplanes for heavenly bodies back then. And so that's the Electra, and they had different versions of it. And so Kelly's answer was, yeah, he designed it, and I redesigned it. Because it came out with the one vertical tail, but he knew that if he put a smaller tail behind each engine, it would fly better when you lose an engine. And so uh, that was a lesson even in World War II that wasn't well known to the pilots. And Tony Levera, who was the test pilot for Lockheed, had to go over to England to tell them that the P-38 would actually fly if you lost an engine, which the word was getting around it wouldn't. And Kelly designed that P-38 Lightning, which... Uh, helped uh, win World War II. Our two leading aces there would be Major Bong of Poplar, Wisconsin, who had 40 victories. He's still America's ace of aces right now. All of them were accomplished in the P-38 Lightning. And then the number two man was Thomas McGuire of, of New Jersey, and we have a McGuire Air Force base over there right now. He had 38 victories. He got killed for the right at the tail end of the war. And Bong got killed on August 6, 1945. What is, why is that date famous? Because that's when Paul Tibbetts dropped the first atomic bomb on Japan. And so everybody, even today, they want to fly the latest, the fastest, and the best. And so uh, a lot of people have been envious of me for being the F-104 test pilot and then the SR-71 test pilot because they would love to have jumped in and done what I luckily were able to do. But Bong, the fastest airplane then, was Kelly Johnson's P-80 Shooting Star. That was the first successful jet in America. He designed that. Everything he did was all cutting edge, and, um, and we'll continue on with it chronologically here. But Bong took off in the English engine. It, America had no gas turbine engine, and so we got the thing from Britain. And um, Kelly used that to make the first um, P-80 Shooting Star. Actually, uh, when we learned that the British had a gas turbine program, then um, Hap Arnold, running the Pentagon over there, gave a contract to Bell Aircraft. And you would put two of these engines into an existing airframe. But it was still, that was what, an unsuccessful program. And the, so then he called up Kelly Johnson and says, I want you to design a, a prototype for just one engine. That became the... Uh, beginning of the famous Lockheed Skunk Works. That was in March 1943. And Kelly uh, designed it in 143 days. And uh, he asked, uh, what's the weight of that thing? What's the weight of the engine? And uh, what is this um, uh, dimensions? And they said, we don't know yet, but as soon as we find out, we'll let you know. He started designing the airframe. Speed was his forte. And his, he wanted no oversight from anybody at any time, even in his youth. So that's the type of personality he had. I'll tell you a little more about that just shortly. But Bong took off, and the way you control the overspeed of the gas turbine uh, in those days was fuel flow. You'd reduce fuel flow, it was going too fast. That malfunctioned. So he got airborne, and of course you had no ejection seats in those days. And he had to crank the canopy back when it started losing altitude right after takeoff on runway 15 at Burbank. I can see that from the hill because my place is above Burbank right now. And uh, he did the canopy back and, and undid his safety harness, stood up and pulled the chute. And it snatched him out of the cockpit and he almost made it but got killed, bang, right before. And his widow, Marge Bong, a married, she was only about 21 or 22 and she married a fellow uh, named Drucker, and I met her uh, after he died. She, out of sensitivity, I presume, for him, then uh, she didn't get involved in um, aviation matters. And uh, she was also from uh, Wisconsin and a boyhood, uh, girlhood friend. That's when they were married. So, um, so, so then let's do the next slide, please, Jeremy. And there you have somebody you've heard of, Amelia Earhart, She's the most famous female pilot in the world, and she did her around-the-world thing where she didn't quite make it uh, in a Lockheed Electra. We had certain modifications to them. You always have a little work in progress that makes them a little different, but it had the similar configuration and so forth. So, um, and, and so then uh, another one in 1938 was uh, Ed Lund, the co-pilot, and Howard Hughes, the pilot, 
And they went around in another Lockheed Electra in three and a half days, thus breaking Wiley Post's record. So um, I don't have a picture of them, but let's move to the next slide. And there you have that P-38 I was telling you about, which was designed in 19, the P-38 in 1938. So uh, Kelly had started the conceptual stuff on it in 37, and he was born in 1910. That makes him age 27 when he got that thing going. And so um, they bought that in quantity, and it was the fastest airplane in the world, and it was the first one that had enough speed to go to higher altitude. And the first pilot on that was a fellow named uh, Marshall Heedle, and it, it damaged his uh, brain because he didn't know enough about the protection of that oxygen in upper atmosphere. So then this man, Milo Burcham, came in, and uh, he went to Mayo's clinic, and they started getting auxiliary oxygen for going to the higher altitudes, because this thing would had enough speed, it'd get up there to 35,000 feet. And so um, it was a great airplane. It's got uh, uh, guns in the center piece of the thing, and so it it is, was especially would have been a murder against a bomber, but it also was a fighter airplane designed to be capable in that area, needless to say. And they built about 10,000 of them uh, before the uh, thing was uh, shut down. And then after the war, my friend Tony LeVere, who was the main test pilot at Lockheed, and he was Mr. P-38. I mentioned he went to England to sh show those guys how to fly the thing when the word was getting around. It wouldn't fly on one engine. He went to um, the first base, P-38 base, and said, Tony LeVere of uh, Southern California is over here to tell you how to fly it on one engine. Nobody came to his lecture. So he said he got the idea to borrow an airplane from them and then go to the next base and uh, feather an engine and fly it upside down down the runway with one engine. And after that, everybody came to his lecture. And I, let, I used to be a military test pilot in Germany, and I had met people that had known about that and heard him when it, and were during World War II. So let's go to the next slide, please, Jeremy. All right, if you'll see that, I don't know if you can read it, but a bit, little bit down at the bottom here, it talks about Dick Bong being our ace of aces, and it also Thomas McGuire. That'll sort of verify the thing. So you can, so you can read that, and I'll take a sip of water. Okay, we've got to move on because I'm told we have one hour only, and I've asked Jeremy to let me know when I have 15 more minutes, and then I'm going to show you um, something Kelly Johnson gave me, which was filmed from the very first flight ever of the SR-71, which I did, and um, you know it holds two in tandem, but we had agreed that I'd be the only guy on board. So we'll get to that down the road here. So let's go to the next slide, please. All right. There we have the military version, which was ordered right at the beginning of World War II. And uh, it turned in, and you notice it had that graceful fuselage with three small tails behind. And so, um, and then in the lower right, I wish they'd had it reversed. You have the colors of TWA. Howard Hughes came in and bought a whole bunch of those things. And one of his requirements was that it had to be haul, haulable into a hangar so it could be worked on at night or in inclement weather. And hence, it doesn't have a big vertical tail. It's got those three small tails, which Kelly had already experimented with in the wind tunnel on that Electra. And so uh, then they shut down the military version because of the war. And it was after the war that uh, they modified it and made a deal with a TWA, and that was the most successful commercial jet going in its day. In fact, we're here in Colorado, and Eisenhower's wife was from here, and they call that the Columbine. That was Air Force One in its day. And he uh, traipsed all around everywhere in that uh, Lockheed Constellation called the Connie, and they kept improving it, too. <clears throat> and it was the first uh, commercial jet, commercial airplane, non-jet propeller that um, was able to comfortably go from New York or Washington to Paris or London nonstop. All these others had to island hop because of shortage of range, including me when I used to fly the Lockheed Jetstar, another Kelly Johnson creation. 
That was the, a little small airplane, and we'll talk about that chronologically down the road here in a minute. So if we would go to the next, um, and there you have the underslung tanks of the P-80, which we mentioned peripherally earlier. And so uh, as the Skunk Works was founded in uh, March of 1943, as I earlier mentioned, then Kelly went to Bob Gross, who owned and ran the company, and uh, he said, I've got this uh, request from uh, Hap Arnold to design a prototype airframe for this thing. And, and, uh, and he said, are you kidding? We aren't going to risk, risk the company's money when we're putting out 17 P-38s a day and all of our engineers uh, stretch to the maximum trying to do that. And Kelly says, but I don't need but just a very few, just a handful. So he grudgingly told Kelly it's okay to go ahead and do it. That became, this, and it's all super secret too, needless to say. Most of what Kelly did uh, was, has been super secret. That's why you don't know his name as much. For example, Willie Messerschmitt, every airplane he produced had his name on it. And same uh, in Russia, they had Antonov and Tupolev and so forth. And uh, Kelly told me he was unique in America in that sense that he achieved uh, a, a lot of a success as a very young man and a lot of influence with the gathering storm of World War II coming on. And, uh, but he said nobody else in, in America is like that, but they have some in Russia. He didn't tell me which ones, but I think they might, that might have been a couple of them. So... He went ahead and in 143 days produced the thing, and um, his crew chief on this th prototype, which we call the Lulu Bell, was the prototype. And uh, he's still alive, named Frank Harvey, and lives in Lancaster, California. And he's a friend of mine, and he's told me all about it. And he said that the English guy came over there and sat in the cockpit, and they were trying to start the engine. And uh, Kelly was there, and he was up on the wing, and uh, they couldn't make the darn engine start. And so Kelly says, I think I know the problem. He says, I don't think it's getting any uh, electricity to the sparks down there. And he said, and Frank Harvey told me, I knew it was uh, getting electricity. And it, but he says, Kelly was always right and you were always wrong, you know. That was his, uh, Kelly, Kelly's uh, attitude and reputation. But he, Kelly was virtually always right, too. But in this case, he was wrong, and it, it shocked. It gave a shock to my friend Frank Harvey. It didn't hurt him or anything, but enough to tell me the story. And then he also added that he didn't think that that thing ever would have flown or been successful with the low thrust to weight ratio of that engine had it, Kelly had not gotten into the every minor, tiny little degree of it. So Kelly came to Lockheed as a schooled aerodynamicist, but to be a designer, you have to be competent in a whole lot of other areas, in particular materials. When he first got there, they didn't hire him as an aerodynamicist. They put him out into the tool shop as a tool designer. So he was interested in every little thing, and so that was a good idea for his future uh, with Lockheed because he knew more about what was going on in the shop than did anybody, any successor that he had. And um, that was an invaluable thing, I think. So next slide, please. And so, by the way, the 80 participated in the Korean War, and it was the first American airplane to ever shoot down an enemy jet. Now, this thing here was a sort of a modified 80, with two uh, people in it, and it was for the Air Defense Command called the F-94 Starfire. And it was the first one with afterburner, if you can see the tail end of it. So I won't spend any more time on that thing. Okay, now we come up to the U-2. Um, uh, when the war broke out in Korea, unexpectedly, by the way, after the Secretary of State for Harry Truman had described the U.S. defense perimeter as Japan, Okinawa, Philippines, he didn't say anything about Korea, that caused Stalin to think that he could authorize the North Koreans to invade the South Koreans, and there would be no response. But it was a response, and uh, that happened on June 25, 1950, and I was just uh, getting my wings at that time, I uh, had gone to... Randolph Field and soloed in the T-6, which in earlier days they called the AT-6 for advanced trainer, but uh, this was our primary trainer. And it had 600 horsepower, and it was designed by North American Aviation, had a tail wheel, and it was a little tricky on landing. Um, 
Now, you could easily ground loop it if you weren't very careful. And they were watching people out before they, they were downsizing from World War II. They didn't need any more pilots. And so they would watch you out if, uh, for any little thing in those days. It changed only after the Korean War started. And so I noticed uh, Chuck Yeager uh, and his uh, girlfriend, wife, uh, ground looped a T-6 over a, a friend of mine who owned the airplane was over there in uh, Georgia when that happened. And um, that's a little embarrassing for him. He was hoping it, it would be kept quiet, by the way. At any rate, uh, it, I've, that was one of the toughest airplanes I ever flew, and I flew a whole lot of different ones. But so, uh, so Kelly's a P... Uh, Kelly went over there with uh, Lee Atwood, who was the co-founder of North American Aviation, with uh, Dutch Kendallberger. They both worked for Donald Douglas Sr. in Cloverfield, Santa Monica. And uh, the purpose of the Pentagon asking them to go over there was to ask the pilots what they thought of the equipment and which, uh, what kind of airplane they thought they would like to design for the future. And all of them said, oh, that's easy. We want one with more speed. We want one that can achieve more altitude, et cetera. So Mr. Edward went back to North American and, um, and headed the design team, but not like Kelly. Kelly was into every little tiny detail. Mr. Edward was not that way. And uh, he was a good friend of mine, Mr. Edward, and I learned a lot from him. He was born in Kentucky, educated in Texas, and he became CEO of North American and he was CEO when we did a little thing known as going to the moon. So I could tell you about that if we had time, but we don't really have time. And so Kelly went back and did the F-104. And so the airplane that Mr. Edwards' team did was called the F-100. That's called the Super Sabre because they had already designed the F-86 Sabre jet. And that was the main airplane for the Korean War, the best airplane. And it went against the MiGs. When I was over there in 1952, being a fighter-bomber pilot out of K-2 Airport, Tegu, Korea, then our opponent airplanes were the MiGs, and they were swept wing. And here in America, uh, we were the, weren't even bombed in World War II. We had all the gold. We had all the money. And we were so complacent that we didn't have the best airplane. And uh, the MiG was about as good as the F-86. They were both swept wing. And so all of the 84 pilots, such as myself, were irked. We, weren't, we went into combat with a worse airplane than the opponent. Jimmy Doolittle used to say, we don't uh, mind uh, being outnumbered. We do mind having worse equipment. And so, um, so much for the Korean War. So then Kelly in the 1950s, uh, he designed uh, several airplanes uh, but the U-2 was the first one. That was an unsolicited proposal from him to uh, the CIA, the agency as it was called back then, at least internally here in the Skunk Works. And so um, they had so much confidence in him and so much faith in him that they gave him a contract. I think it was a, you know peanut money, like $20 million, and he produced so many of them. And it's really uh, Tony LeVere who made the first flight describes it as a sailed plane with a jet engine. And so you fly that thing, it goes real high, but not all that fast. And I was a good friend of uh, Francis Gary Powers, and you may have heard of him. He's the one who was shot down on May 1st, 1960, over Sverdlovsk, Russia. I got to, I was going to say, I came out there to Lockheed. I used to have, be in five different military organizations. And so um, I don't even know of anybody that's been in that many. But um, I'm most known for being a civilian test pilot for Lockheed because uh, all of that other stuff that meant nothing as long as Kelly Johnson wanted you. The, everybody was afraid to cross him, including the Pentagon. So if he liked you, everybody else could think you're a dumbbell, and he liked you, you'd be okay. So at um, so any rate... Uh, uh, Powers was shut down in 1960, and before that, Kelly already in his mind knew that a SAM missile might get him, surface to air missile as a SAM. That's what did get him, and Powers told me he was at 68,000 feet, a beautiful day, and, and no, the fighters couldn't get up there, and they'd made other incursions over Russia, and he had come off from uh, Pakistan, and he was going to land over there in uh, Norway, hopefully. 
And so he said that uh, he saw this flash come over his left shoulder and illuminate the instrument panel. And the next thing he knew, the airplane broke in two. And um, we, they had a destruction switch that uh, had he used the ejection system, it would have had a time delay and then exploded in the wings and the air fuselage and it'd come down in tiny little pieces like that. That didn't happen. Big pieces came down and the Russians got it. But anyway, he came on down and landed in a farmer's field and he joked that if uh, he could have spoke Russian, he could have told the far- farmer, please get me a car, I'd like to go to Moscow immediately. And so, because naturally they thought he was Russian too. <laughs> And nobody knew he was doing it. Nobody in the U.S. knew he was overflying except the president, almost, Eisenhower. And uh, the Russians knew it, but they didn't want to talk about it because they couldn't do anything about it until then. And so, but Kelly knew that he might be, because he had only go, they'd go 550 miles an hour, and he was at 68,000. The wingspan was uh, 80 feet. Uh, they later improved it and went to 100 feet on the uh, successor with a better engine and was able to go slightly higher but still pretty slow. And so Kelly thought if he could design something that would go miles higher than the U-2 and uh, four or five times faster, which was the SR-71, then he, no fighter could get it, no SAM could get it, because you had to make it very reliable because if anything happened to either engine or either inlet, then you'd have to come downhill and then they would get you. But... Um, that's, that's enough for, the, uh, for that, and so um, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, that, that shows you a little bit about how the U-2 works. It's got the uh, outriggers there, and the wingspan is so great, and uh, it's a, like a sailplane, so when it lands, then it has to just fall off on a wing like that because there's no wheels out there. But for the takeoff, they have those little things that fall away. So next slide. Okay, here's the 104. This was also designed contemporaneously almost with the U-2, and that's the one that evolved from Kelly's uh, visit to uh, the Korean War people. And, um, and see that little wing there? This is a fighter-bomber version that they made of it, and the one down there in the lower left is the fighter-interceptor version of it, and that thing is uh, in front of the uh, test pilot school at Edwards Air Force Base. And all of the X-15 pilots... Uh, had to learn to fly the F-104 because to learn to fly the X-15, which had a similar lift over drag and speed conditions and all that, then uh, it would be a way to prepare. And Neil Armstrong, who was the first man on the moon, was a 104 pilot and s- because he flew the X-15, and uh, most of the other astronauts did not. At any rate, um, the Germans especially made a fighter-bomber out of the F-104, which already had the highest wing-loading uh, per square foot known to man. And they used to say simultaneously the U-2 had the lowest wing loading, and that is another testament to the genius of Kelly Johnson because he, both concepts came out of his head simultaneously. And so the 104 right now currently holds the world's speed record for, um, out, for the speed record in low altitude. And the uh, uh, official location for all official speed records is Paris, the uh, FAI. That stands for Federation Aeronautique Internationale, and it's all metric, by the way. And so way back in the days of um, 1910 and so forth, then that's when they established the speed record. And until jets came along, it was the, the absolute speed record and the low altitude speed record were one and the same. But for the jets, it then became different. And so the rules are you have to make four passes and you have a 5 km trap and you have a 1 km lead in and then you have a, a measurement of 3 km that they measure and then you go out and do a 180 and you, got, you can go to 500 meters then. The definition of low altitude is 100 meters above ground level or below. So um, I was involved with um, the 104 when we, Daryl Greenemeyer, whom I checked out in the 104, we went up there and broke the world speed record. That was in 1978, and it's still the world's fastest. And, and I think another 104 might be able to break their own record, uh, possibly because it's got to be done by over 1% to be recognizable. And we had so little money to play with back then, we didn't have an opportunity to um, optimize the profile necessarily. 
So anyway, this is a great airplane. And so it got the reputation early on because it killed a lot of first-rate pilots. One of the more famous ones is Ivan Kinchlow. He was known as the uh, first, first man in space in, in America in a rocket airplane. And so he and I got our wings at the same place at the same time, flying 80s over there in uh, Arizona. And so he married, and his wife was named Dorothy, and after he got killed, and I'll tell you how that happened in just a moment, and I helped get her a job at Lockheed, and she's still around, by the way, Dorothy Kinchlow. He was from Michigan. And so um, what happened is this. Edwards used to provide, and still do, uh, chase planes for experimental flights by the uh, company pilots. So my friend Lou Schalk, whom I knew, I met him in Germany, and uh, he was also a Lockheed test pilot uh, later, as I was. Then he was flying an uh, experimental uh, flight on the 104, and so um, they had some 104s up there at Edwards, and so Kinchlow takes off to chase him, and they were going to join up and then do the, whatever the test required. And so the engines back in those days were made in uh, uh, Evendale, which is a suburb of Cincinnati, and the designer of the engine... Uh, whom I also knew, and he's the one. Now GE is the most successful uh, engine manufacturer of jet engines in the whole world. And it all became about because of this fellow named Hermann the German. He was born in Berlin, and his name was uh, Gerhard Neumann. And he, got, uh, he was uh, sent over to um, Hong Kong to be an automobile guy at about age 20 when the war broke out. And then he got in with the Flying Tigers over there in Kunming, China, and that's Claire Chenault and those guys, and uh, then he would crew those P-40s, and the one this four-star general head of SAC who was over there too uh, from East Tennessee told me, he says, having uh, him crew our P-40s was like having, uh, 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 what's the name of the guy that, with General uh, Motors, uh, the technological guy, uh, he did Delco, Dayton Electric Company, uh, <laughs> He's the one who said, beware of logic. It's only a way of going wrong with confidence. Um, let's see. I can't think of his name right now. But anyway, um, so we get, getting back to the uh, whole uh, program there, then uh, the 104 became uh, sort of a bad name in America. It was called the Widowmaker. And uh, the Pentagon bought uh, less, something like 270 of them total. And there were a lot of other famous pilots killed in the 104 too. And we had downward ejection in that thing. Nobody liked that. And I remember complaining about that one time, and Kelly kind of testily says to me, the Pentagon put out an RFP, that means a request for a proposal, and I had to meet their proposal. And then one of the requirements was you had to, have an escape capability at Mach 2. This thing would go Mach 2 easily. The airplane that Mr. Uh, Lee Atwood went back with North America in the F-100, maximum 1.5 Mach. So what impressed me first about this 104 was it was temperature limited because the faster you go, the harder things get. It's made of aluminum, so it's got a temperature limit, not a drag limit like all these other airplanes, like the um, f uh, uh, 100 of North American in, at that same time frame. And I was impressed by the fact you could pull 5 G's and normally that causes your speed to decay. No, you can pull 5 G's in this thing and it doesn't decay at all. And that's one of the things that Gunther Rahl, uh, he was one of my students in the 104, a German Luftwaffe guy, and he'd been in World War II and he's still alive. And uh, I just mentioned our Ace of Aces had 40 victories and he's the leading living ace alive in the world today, and he had 275 victories. And so he liked this 104. And our first jet ace in America was Jimmy Jabara. I don't know if you ever heard of him from uh, Wichita. I'd heard of him when I was over in Korea reading the Stars and Stripes one time. Uh, he was up at K-14 Seoul, and I was down at K-2 Airport in uh, Taegu. And they interviewed him, and they said, what do you think of this war over here? Because he hadn't declared war in uh, Korea. And he says, well, I'd rather try to shoot him down over here than over Wichita, because that's where he was from, and his dad was a big wheel at either Cessna or Beach. I can't remember which. And he was a fine guy. And I f uh, first met him because after uh, he, he went to Germany after the 
brought him out of Korea and he gave, came to our base in Munich, Germany and gave a lecture to the, uh, us pilots. And, and I was sitting down there in the front row with this other lieutenant who was a friend of mine. And, and Jabara started telling him about what, the way they were operating over in Korea. And he got interrupted by the second lieutenant and he says, did you say so and so? And that was kind of impolite, I thought, to interrupt him. And he said, yes. And he says, well, in that event, you're doing it all wrong. And so uh, here he has never been in combat, and he's talking to this big hero this, in like manner. But many of these fighter pilots are very uh, uh, individualistic-minded, and they, a lot of them are, don't, are not uh, amenable to authority at all, one of whom was John McCain. I've seen many, many, many others like that, too. And maybe I'm that way, too, but we won't go into that right now. <laughs> so um, so any rate, let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, there's a, one with German markings, and it says Marine in the back, and um, different countries got the F-104. Even though America didn't like it, um, we kept improving it and getting it better. We went with upward ejection, we got the engine more reliable, and I'll describe the wing aerodynamically here in just a moment. But that's the only, uh, they gave it to the German Navy as well, and they were really thrilled with it. And it had another th reputation initially as uh, Die Wittemacher, Auf Deutsch, means the Widowmaker over there. And so I remember Der Spiegel is the name of the magazine, then sort of like Look or Life magazine, and they interviewed these 104 German pilots, and it said, much to their surprise, uh, even though they called it the Widowmaker, all these guys liked it, they loved it. And so... Uh, the Navy was the only ones in the whole world. They had a worldwide consortium. All of our major American allies got permission from Lockheed to build airframes and from General Electric to build engines. And I'll uh, name some of them. was Japan and then uh, Taiwan and uh, Canada. That was the CF-104, they called it up there, built in a... Uh, a I went up there and I trained these guys. They would come to Palmdale and I would check them out. And they would just send their leading pilots or their civilian test pilots. And so that's where I first met Gunter Rahl. I have a picture I thought I wish I'd put on this uh, PowerPoint showing me and Rahl. And you can see where his left thumb has been shot off in combat. And it didn't bother him because I said, if I get in close on you and I say speed breaks out now, how are you going to do that? He said, I'll have no trouble. <laughs> he said, I could do it with this finger because it's on the throttle. And you've got to do it simultaneously. Otherwise, there's a burble and you might collide with each other. So next slide, please. Okay, there's the Lockheed Jetstar. And Kelly designed that also uh, in the 50s. And it was the Cadillac of corporate jets. LBJ had one called Air Force One Half that he would fly down to Paternalis Ranch with a short uh, runway. And uh, I flew that thing around and... Kelly had the original prototype but had two engines back on the fuselage and they were British engines. And so the Pentagon told him, we'll never buy that thing uh, unless you have American engines in it. So they went to uh, four baby Pratts, two on each side. So I never flew the one with two engines, but I did fly the ones with the baby Pratt and Whitney's. So um, next slide on that. It carry about uh, 12 or 13 people and I'd fly the chairman of the board of Lockheed around. I flew him all the way around to and parked in... Uh, Maribad Airport at Iran in the Shah's hangar with it. So now you have the beginning of uh, this other thing that's worth noting, the Lockheed C-130, Hercules. Now that was also a 1950s uh, design, and Kelly was very busy then doing U-2, and the uh, Mach, he was only interested in the supersonic stuff. And so a proposal came out from the Pentagon and uh, they met the proposal, and Kelly called in Willis Hawkins, who later became chief scientist of Lockheed, and I knew him. And he said, um, Kelly gave me the con general configuration he wanted for the, uh, his airplane, but he was too busy to do anything, and so he told Willis Hawkins, now you go out and design it. So Willis really is the designer of all the minutia of this airplane. And so guess what? It started production in the 50s, all through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, going strong now with the C-130J model with six-bladed props, and uh, they're made in Britain of composite. And so when you add up power on this thing, and you can be fully loaded, and most transport pilots used to be concerned about loading them so much that it doesn't have enough performance left. When you, when you 
rev up those uh, turboprops and they blow wind over your wing, you're a short takeoff and land vehicle. And that's why it's been, you put skis on it and it's in Antarctica. It's outdone the old famous DC-3 Goonie Bird of World War II fame and versatility. And to think it's going so strong right now. When I was in Toulouse, France, and they told me about their version of this thing, what they wanted to do, and they call it the A for Airbus, 400M for military. And they have these various European countries that want to buy it in lieu of the C-130J, which they could now get. And so they've had trouble and delayed in the production of it. And their main test pilot over there in Toulouse is a German fellow I know named Karl Heinz May, M-A-I. And uh, he was supposed to, he did the A380, but now he's supposed to do this A400 thing, but it's being delayed. And so... Uh, some of these countries don't like the delay, and they're wanting to now order more C-130G models. So this built in Georgia at Lockheed Marietta, and the head of the program is named Ross Reynolds, a friend of mine, and I was with him over in Italy about three or four or five years ago. I can't remember the time very well. And I said, you probably got clout with these Italians because they've got 25 of these uh, C-130Js. He says... Yeah, uh, and I'd like you to get me a ride in it. He said, I can do better than that. And I said, what's that? He says, I can get us both a ride in it. So we did. And so I've been in that model one time back in the... Yes, what? 15 minutes. Oh, time. It's time up. No, yeah. No. 15 minutes. 15. All right, let's, um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, back to the SR. Okay, this thing... I want to tell you about the first flight of the SR, so can you rig that and then come back to this? And so we had meetings prior to the first flight, engineering meetings, and uh, we had gone ahead to decide what would be available for the first flight and what would not, and, in, and the um, sole criterion would be safety of flight. And Kelly liked to do things fast, and he was all business, and we, I would meet him every Monday morning at 7 a.m. He'd usually get there at 6 and call back east because of the time differential. Now, here we are backing it out. Notice the tail number there is 950, and uh, that's uh, assigned by the Air Force uh, for the prototype with all the fancy instrumentation, and Kelly was big on instrumentation. He said, if you've got, oh, gosh, I'm going too fast. There's Kelly in the two-engine jet star, and he's coming up for the first flight. And you, I'm going to... That's him getting out right there with the English engines, two engines. And so these are some of his guests from back east at Strategic Air Command of SAC. And then you'll see me shaking hands there on the left. And I'm not in a pressure suit because we're going to go low altitude only. And so um, I had, then I have to take off. I was already up there getting ready before he flew up. And so uh, I'm getting in the airplane now. And I had three chase airplanes. We always have chase airplanes for every experimental flight. Often only one, but this time we had three. They were all F-104s. One from a colleague at Lockheed in the single-seater, and then the other two came from Edwards with two-seaters with a cameraman in the back. And some of the film, you'll video, see the, on the scratches, the vertical from the film. Uh, the, those guys took pictures of us, and I had to cut the thing down to five minutes because when you give a talk, uh, you want to make it just brief. So here I am taxiing out, and we had experimental engines, and you had to go out to the end of the runway and open up each one and fine-tune the fuel flow uh, on the engine so it doesn't over-temp on takeoff. And this is out of Palmdale heading to the west. And these other guys are already airborne, and I'm, when I get ready, they have to tell me when to start taking off because then they'd be in position for the chase. And the, it was December 22, 1964, so it's winter. And our plan was to take off and go up to the east side of the Sierra Nevada in Owens Valley, subsonic. And, and Kelly uh, had, and I had written what we we're going to do. He signed it, I signed it, and we'd do that and nothing but that, and that's professionalism. If you want to have any arguments or discussions, you do that on the ground before the next flight. Okay, here we are rolling. And I've got a light load, and I was worried about the... Um, uh, fact that I didn't, they might not have the center of gravity right because when you never do anything the first time, so I took off 30 knots fast to be sure I had more elevon control in case they screwed up the CG. So I'm getting airborne here. Uh, I'm heading west and I'm going to go up to 25,000 feet and come out of burner and then uh, slow down and these guys get behind me and that's what you see. This was taken by one of those Edwards uh, two-seated 104s. 
And there's a, taking a picture of the other two by the third 104. All right, we went up there, and I'll tell you about the only major emergency I had on this flight. And here we are making a pass after we got back to land, and Kelly's over there with his guests. And he says, how's your fuel? Have you got time for a flyby? And I said, yes, fuel's okay. So we did. And then we did two flybys. And uh, you notice I want to get real low to make the flyby impressive, but the chase plane's got to fly beneath my blow wash, so I want it low enough to where it didn't wipe him off on the concrete, you see. <laughs> And so the, here it starts siphoning fuel, and Kelly told me that a guy nudged one of those generals and said, what's that? It's a malfunction. And that was on the second pass. It's not dangerous, but uh, we got a fuel dump system, and it malfunctioned. We got plenty of fuel, so it wasn't dangerous. Or, so then we come back in, a, go, come to land now, I think. Here we are coming to land. And uh, you notice I touch down on the main gear and hold the nose off, and then the big 40-foot drag chute comes out, but it touches the concrete, and that damages the chute. And later, I told all the customers to touch the nose down before they deploy the drag chute. When that big 40-foot drag chute comes out, it puts on such drag that uh, it feels like landing on an aircraft carrier. And uh, for that reason, the brakes and the design are very weak in the SO-71. Why? Because weight is anathema to performance. You want to get rid of every ounce you can. And I'm going to talk about the Boeing SST in a moment, and that's something they didn't know anything about, I might add. They learned, though. Okay, here we are taxiing in, and since we didn't crash, everybody's real happy. <laughs> so there I am getting out. They would usually uh, have two guys on either side help you in and out, especially if you're in a pressure suit, which weighs about 50 pounds. As you can see, my hair's a little tassel there. <laughs> no change. Yeah, it's still the same, but at least I got a little left. So let's see, what do we do? Then we have a debriefing, and, uh, and there's a, uh, Dick Miller is with him, and he used to ride in the back seat with me. He was in charge of all U-2 and SOS operations at Edwards and Palmdale. So he would go with me. And you see, Kelly wrote that thing to me, to Bob Gilliland, thanks for a fine first flight. And he gave that to me. Uh, and it was sitting on my wall for all these years. And I said, what the heck, I'll get a Xerox of it. Because some people heard I had it and wanted to. This was the one I did in uh, San Diego, and it shows the relative configurations. And the, I told you I wanted to talk about the aerodynamics of the wing. You say we only have uh, 15, 10 minutes now? Uh, seven minutes. Seven minutes. Well, uh, okay, we'll talk about uh, Boeing SST. What happened here was... They had three companies, a North American, Lockheed, and Boeing, that wanted to do the American supersonic transport. So they eliminated first North American. Then it's Boeing and Lockheed. And Mr. McNamara, whom I hope I have time to denounce in this meeting, <laughs> as I had earlier promised, um, he was the main architect of our field policies in Vietnam. And he had... Um, he was the one who chaired the committee that gave it to Boeing. And Kelly was very surprised at that. He says, well, Boeing's never built a supersonic airplane. And he'd already been into it over a dozen years, you know, with the Mach 3 and the Mach 2 stuff. And, uh, but, but I think uh, McNamara didn't like Kelly. But, uh, but you'd think he wouldn't be uh, treasonous, which he was when he ordered all of the SR-71 parts destroyed, as Jane Orient mentioned the other day. That was treason. But he was the uh, author of something called, uh, you know, um, a mutual defense, ma mad, mutual, mutual assured, assured destruction. Yeah, yeah, mutual assured destruction. Mutual, that's the key thing. So it was under Reagan, by the way, that they built up the U.S. military, and uh, that is what brought the Soviet Union down and ended the Cold War. And I might add that Dr. Teller was the author of the SDI, the, and that's one thing that the Russians realized. If they didn't believe anybody else they did believe, he might be capable of doing just that. That helped bring down the Russians, by the way, and the Berlin Wall went down in 1989. So now we're back to this. So at any rate, uh, Kelly, uh, they won, Boeing won it in part because it was a switchblade airplane. It would go out for landing to straight wing, and then they'd, for supersonic, you'd go uh, back and lean it back. And the F-111 airplane of General Dynamics in Fort Worth was being simultaneous with that. And so uh, I was in Kelly's office one time late in the afternoon when we were talking about the F-111. That was known as McNamara's Folly, by the way. It was also called the TFF, TFX. And so he sh looks through these papers and he shoved it across the desk at me and I look at it. It says U.S. Patent Office. 
uh, inventor, C.L. Johnson, year 1948. And then it showed a, a plan view of a, a P-80 shooting star, which we've already talked about. And, he, and Kelly got the patent for the uh, wings going back and forth. And so uh, they were uh, getting ready to do the one in Fort Worth. This was about the same time as Boeing was doing the SST. And I said, well, what are you going to do about this thing in Fort Worth? He said, nothing. I consider myself a patriot. And so uh, and that's despite the fact that he owned the um, patent. And I said, did you have to assign the patent to Lockheed or uh, do you, you still own it? And he said, I own it. That was before they thought to make all employees assign patents there. So that's the irony of the thing, that uh, Boeing won it, and then after they played with their wing swept deal for three years, then they went to the system that Kelly proposed. All he proposed was an upscale model of the SR, which was already a proven prototype. And I believe that had Kelly won it, we'd be flying around in Mach uh, 3 across these oceans and uh, right now, and it'd be routine. And that was how close things can happen politically. Is my time up yet? I don't know if we have time for questions or answers. Though. It's about three minutes. Three minutes of questions. Yes, sir. Anybody have one? Well, I'll tell you, if, if nobody has one, I'll talk further about the Boeing thing. Um, Bill Magruder was Nixon's SST chief, and he was from, uh, did the DC-8 at Douglas. So he left Douglas and came over to Lockheed when he assumed that, Lock, that Kelly would win when he knew that uh, he already had been flying this stuff. And with his personality and ability, he would pull it off if nobody else could have pulled it off. So he came over there, and I took him over to our chief aerodynamicist named Dick Fuller and explained everything about the SR to him. And I even told Kelly, we ought to get this guy, Magruder, a ride in the SR-71. And so we did get him one ride, but it, I wasn't the pilot who flew him, just an indoctrinational ride. But they forgot to pull the, the gear down lock pins with the big red flag on him, so he took off, but they couldn't go except subsonic, and he flew around and then landed. And when he'd go out around making speeches on the American SST, people would say, have you flown the SR-71? He said, yes, I have. And let it go at that. <laughs> well, uh, if no one has it. What was the fastest speed you ever flew on the SR-71? The design speed on the airplane is 3.2 Mach. Kelly Johnson decided everything. It was a one-man show. And, um, and the faster you go, the harder things get. So that is the design speed. And the fastest we ever went under, with instrumented conditions uh, was 3.3. And among uh, people were thinking that if it got any hotter, and we were roughly an 800F airplane, Fahrenheit. Some parts would be hotter, some would be lower, but that's a general thing in a self-cleaning oven's 425 and a soldering iron's 550. And we were 800, so we're talking big time heat here. That answer your question. Any other questions? Can you, can you say anything more about why the SST program uh, either failed or was uh, destroyed? Uh, it was uh, at a time of, of um, the Vietnam War, which was just big, being term terminated. And remember, LBG said we can have guns and butter both, meaning uh, we can do all this spending and, and so forth. It, uh, and the Vietnam War was costing all this money. People were trying to get out of it. It was a bad time for research and development. That would be one reason. Financial, it, it's a crisis, sort of like it is now, but not the one now is much worse, I would think. Any other questions on any topic? Yes, sir. Just, just a quick uh, comment. I was I enjoyed your, your uh, observation that uh, Jaeger had, had uh, ground looped T6. Did you know that? Uh, because uh, I remember not too long ago uh, ground looping a, a, a steerman, and uh, I was feeling pretty bad and uh, rather embarrassed, and somebody said to me, there's only two kinds of steerman pilots those that have ground looped and those who will. <laughs> so, I've heard that. <laughs> I think the T6 is probably the same thing. Yes. Thank you. Bob, when the uh, SR-71 flew from California to Dulles for the uh, final resting place in the Air and Space Museum, do you remember what the uh, flight time was? It was just over one hour. Because I would go to Florida, uh, taking off max gross weight, which the Air Force saw was dangerous, so they never took off except partial weight. And then they'd hit a tanker and get a full load of fuel. That costs more and takes more time. But uh, he took off with, uh, and then zapped across the country. He's a good friend of mine named Ed Yielding, who now flies for 
Northwest Air and a merger with Delta now. And so, by the way, we, a lot of people here have talked about Al Gore. He told me he used to fly after he left the SR program. He flew at Andrews and flew those people around and like uh, Hillary and Gore and so forth. And so he said uh, he went back to the men's room one time and Gore was there and he had been, Gore had been told he'd flown the SR-71. So Gore told him, he says, that uses an awful lot of fuel, doesn't it? And he thought that was a strange comment that Gore made. He told me about that. 